Good morning, everyone. Um, this is super exciting. Um, I've, you know, I'm going to be talking about movement of animals, and there's a lot of technology that's already happened. Oops, a little cut off. Um, the big challenge in conservation biology is to understand where, why, how, and when animals move, and how that's related to biodiversity. And really, if we were able to track every individual animal from its birth to its death, we would gain information right now that we don't have. We would learn about you know, where they're born, what habitats they use, how they have social interactions, where they die, why they die. Those are all things we don't know for most of the species we really care about. If we know that information, we can be much more efficient and effective in our plans for conservation, conser conserving animals. Movement is an incredibly important fact of at least animal life, but probably also plant life. Now, if you don't move, you're dead. So, you know, it really understanding that is very critical. But it's also, there's a huge value to society for us to better understand why animals move. We can better understand how, how populations are connected, what we need to do to keep them connected. We can understand how animals spread. Perhaps we can also understand these ecosystem services where animals can spread the seeds of plants and those things could be extremely important to maintain biodiversity and forest fragments into the future. And it goes on and on, so not a disease. I think you could probably think of other examples yourself. So there's probably a huge value to understanding movement. Um, Alex has already pointed out in this morning in the session, this has done more for conservation biology than most technology out there. You know, it has a miniaturized GPS, it has an efficient battery, it has an accelerometer that tells you which way you're oriented. All this kind of technology which has pushed, helped us push movement ecology into a completely new field in ecology itself. And so we're tracking lots of animals. There's lots of innovation happening already. You can see on the, on the left the giraffe. Have you ever thought about how you put a collar around the giraffe? It actually is not very good for the animal because with the neck it's very sensitive. So people have tried backpacks and different kinds of things. And the latest development we have is a tiny solar-driven GPS tracker that's attached to the ossicon. Might not work because they fight with the ossicons, the males. But, <laughs> but uh, so far, it looks like the least invasive design. And the preliminary testing shows they work really, really well because they're always above the vegetation. They always get sun. They could potentially last for years. Um, so we track a lot of stuff. We have all this technology. I'm going to not talk too much about this, but you know the, the, the current push really has to do with the access to relatively small GPS-based, uh, cell phone-based, or satellite phone-based um, transmitters. So we can track things in really remote places. But there are some, some very severe limitations in that we can only track big things. But the majority of things that we're really interested in are very small, bats, migratory birds, there's, I, I don't know how many thousands of migratory birds there are that we don't know the most basic things about. You know, we don't know which breeding population is connected to what wintering population. We don't know where they go, when, how, why. All that stuff is lost to us. So that's on the big scale, but it's also really relevant on the, on the fine scale where we really want to understand how animals interact in the system. So you know, right now it's all based on individuals. We're tracking a few individuals, that's very cool. People love it. It helps us build empathy for conservation because you can track, I don't know, Dumbo the elephant, whatever you want to call it. People get really excited about it. But ultimately, we would love to track thousands of individuals of multiple species in an entire system and really get this interaction that right now we are completely missing. There are places where this is already starting. It's much easier to do in an open landscape, right? Because most of this is some kind of radio wave that's being transmitted and that you have to receive somewhere. So in an open landscape, you have little distraction, um, you have little reflection, and you can track it. But if you try to do this in forests, it's really hard. Um, you know, past solutions for this kind of focused on trying not to track on the ground. So you know, when you think about a radio signal traveling through the forest, if you travel parallel to the ground, you hit all this vegetation, you kind of drop out right away. But if you go through the canopy, you just have that distance you travel through the vegetation, so you get a much better signal. So you work with towers or airplanes. Um, but there, and there are some really cool solutions that already exist. So, so the challenge is kind of to develop a system, an ecosystem-based system that will allow tracking of multiple small species in a forest ecosystem. The technology that already exists that this could be built around on or could kind of spin off is there are relatively small transmitters already. There are nano UHF um, transmitters that are small enough to put on tiny animals. There may be potential with RFIDs. 
But um, I think the difficulty there might be range, but that would be really also interesting to explore. So RFIDs, they don't send out a radio signal, and they're passive, so they don't need a battery. They're, you know, they're very simple. They can be very tiny, but you need to have some kind of an active antenna system that sends out a signal that bounces off. There is a system that's worth looking at when you're developing this. It's called Atlas. It was developed by um, an, an Israeli group. It's, a, it's actually in Hua Valley in Israel. And they have these towers, and they're using these VHF signals. And what's very innovative about this is that they're using, they have a way that they can almost GPS accuracy um, from the GPS positions based on how the signals come back. Don't ask me. I'm not a physicist. I don't know how it works. Um, some people, in very few cases, people are talking about using UAVs to try and find things. I, I only know of one case, and I don't think it's operational. Um, so, the, you know, there are some attempts that people have made. Um, I'm not sure they really represent the optimal kind of approach, or that's, that's really the right strategy to go. Um, so really, what I would love to see is something that is a relatively flexible, field-ready solution that can be used in, a, in an environment that has a very dense vegetation and that could um, be used to track a lot of animals. Now, so 40 is actually not that many, but I think as an initial challenge, that would be nice. And you know, we're talking about small animals. You know, think about, I was trying to think about something local, but you can make this sexier by thinking any forest in the world, and you think some tiny mammal. Perhaps it's even possible to do amphibians or reptiles, um, be even more interesting, because we know nothing about their movements. Um, and then a relatively small area, but still, when you start trying to develop a solution, 100 hectares can be really tough, actually. Um, and perhaps if sustaining tracking, daily tracking for four months, that would be like a breeding season. Uh, those are, I mean, I think that's a realistic space that could be filled, but that's challenging enough. And it should be fully automated. I, you know, we don't have 50 people to send out every day and every night. On top of that, many of these environments, you don't want to send someone out at night because it's not optimal if there are tigers around or other things. <laughs> <clears throat> so you know, I, there is a lot that's already available. So this isn't perhaps uh, the difficulty here. But I think what, what I would like to see is some, a group coming up with something that they think could be sustained over a longer period of time, um, is, is relatively quickly to do, is relatively inexpensive, and, and allows this collecting of this type of information. Um, and I'm, I'm around the whole meeting. I would love to sit down with um, you guys. In general, actually, I would love to see a lot more of interactions like this. I've been a conservation biologist for 30 years, and what you find is you're supposed to be a fundraiser, a scientist, um, an engineer. You can't be all these things. So we need these multidisciplinary approaches where people with technical skills join you know, with the people that have the social skills or whatever it is. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Peter. Um, one of the things I'm wondering is, what is this sort of, say, spatial and time resolution that you need to kind of learn about these species? So you were saying earlier that the Israeli team figured out how to do this sort of GPS level accuracy. But is that, is, is that what is needed? Or can we say, oh, we know they're in this region, <coughs> and that's still enough to kind of learn and kind of build new inferences off of? This is an excellent question, and, and it's, of course, a complicated issue. Um, so, so in terms of spatial accuracy, we would, we would like GPS-level mm -hmm. accuracy, because you really need to pinpoint where this mm -hmm. animal is in space. But then the question is, you know, what's your, what's your recording frequency? How many positions yeah. a day yep. do you need? Um, and that's driven by the basic questions that you're asking. So if you, if you wanted to calculate a home range for an animal, you would want a few positions a, a day and night over a really long period of time, whereas mm -hmm. if you wanted to know what are the activity patterns of this animal during the day, you would want to have you know, five, 15 minute yeah. resolution. So I would look for a medium level. I would say if you can get a position every hour through the day um, with GPS position accuracy, that would be incredible. If we could track 10 chickadees, 10 chipmunks, mm -hmm. 10 for a full field season at one hour resolution in a four, that would, that, no one has that data set. Yeah, that'd be new. Okay, great. Okay, I shouldn't be asking questions because I'm technically a judge. But <laughs> I just had a question around food chain, um, which is just, are there food chain issues, right? So you have a small animal, you put a tracker on it, another animal eats it. 
and now the trackers and the other animals. So is that something that our uh, team should think about? <laughs> um, I, don't, I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. So from, a, from, a, from my perspective, that's a mortality event. This is what I was talking about. It's a mortality event. I, you know, the, I mean, getting to the point where you track the predator. But, you know, the probability of these animals to be eaten is not even that high. Yeah, so, but, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, but, you know, my, my main point here would be to know that an animal died and why mm -hmm. it died and finding the location where it died is something that we usually don't get. And it, it's True. very critical information for us. We'll fight it out. <laughs> we'll fight it. Can, I, can I do this one? Right. I think he has a better question. Peter, 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 I'll give you the next one, Chris. Peter, <laughs> Peter, this is my question to you. What is your mood shot? What seems impossible in the movement space that you want to challenge these teams? You've given us something that seems feasible. What could be, what is the toughest animal out there to actually track okay, where well. the information would be completely transformative to their conservation? If we're talking about small animals, yeah. then, you know, I don't think anyone has tracked salamanders. Yeah, so, and if you, but it, I think it would require an RFID solution. You know, then, so there are people that have tracked salamanders in the ground with RFID, which is very interesting because we don't know where they go in the soil. But they're basically walking with, uh, yeah, they have to walk with uh, with a detector over the ground. Yeah. But. All right. Thanks. Peter. Thanks.